welcome everyone. It's so exciting to see everyone here together. I was reflecting back on our last time together all the way back in February, which at this point feels like a lifetime ago when we had the opportunity to all meet in person for orientation. And I'm really excited that today we get to have our first session together after that. And I think that you're in for a real treat today and I can't wait to tell you a little bit about it. To start, I want to give a few Zoom notes. I know some of us are practically living our lives on Zoom and for others, it might be a little bit newer. And I want to give a couple of um, comments and recommendations on how we're going to use it together as a tool. And this is kind of how we'll use it throughout the program. So this is a good chance for us to calibrate now. So first, um, please keep your cameras on if you are able to. It most closely replicates the experience of us all being together in person, which is what I know we're all really craving right now in this time of physical distancing. Um, secondly, please add your company on your Zoom name. That will help everyone to start to get to know you. And the way that you can do that is if you scroll to the top right corner of your own video and click the dot, 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 and then click rename, you can put your company name in parentheses and then we can all start to get to know each other a little bit better. Please use the raise hand function when you have a question and especially during the Q&A portion, I'm going to ask for you to use the raise hand function, then I'll call on you and then unmute yourself to ask your question. If you are not speaking, please keep yourself on mute. We all know there's lots of background noise and it kind of changes. That's my dog barking right now, as a matter of fact. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as in order to minimize the unintended dog barks, I mean, sometimes they, you know, brighten our day, but um, please keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking and then unmute yourself um, after I call on you. So that's just a little bit of our kind of like rules for engagement on Zoom. And also I would ask you to please close out of anything that's going to be distracting. So I just closed out of my email. So you might want to close out of your email, out of Slack, anything that's going to ping or flash, anything that's going to take away from your experience and your ability to be fully present today. Because if we were able to be together in person, we would be putting away all of our devices. And so let's replicate that as closely as possible. So most importantly, I want to welcome you and I hope that you're all joining us feeling safe and healthy. You know that these are really crazy times that we find ourselves in and I'm feeling like in this time of physical distancing where many of us are at home though I know some of you are also essential workers and you're not at home but I'm feeling like you know community is more important than ever and I'm excited about the ability for this group to serve as that community and for this session today to further your leadership toolkit. I want to thank Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts which is our sponsor for making this possible and I want to thank our wonderful partner in this session, Suffolk University. And Sonia is going to give you a welcome in just a minute or two, but I just want to tell you that we really couldn't do it without them. This session was actually co-created with them. So every step of the way, they have been instrumental in shaping the curriculum, helping to create the activities that we're going to experience today. And Suffolk has this amazing history of being really involved at the intersection of business and government. So I couldn't think of a better partner to do this with than them. And um, typically we'd get to be in their beautiful space, but we are on their beautiful Zoom. So thank you for hosting us digitally today, Suffolk. Uh, so you know, Boston's future leaders, our goals are all about building your socially conscious and civically engaged leadership toolkits, frameworks, and networks. And today will be a really key building block for you for that. You know, increasingly we're seeing that customers and employees are really demanding that leaders in all sectors are civically engaged and are at the forefront of social justice issues. And I think COVID has really brought to light just how intersected these you know, sectors truly are. So I think that this session will really help you to kind of build that theme. Just the theme of today is leading through change. And we're going to focus both on how to respond to unexpected change, which probably feels familiar to us right now, and then also how to steward the positive change that we want to see in our teams, in our organizations, and in our sectors. So I wanted to get a quick sense from all of you about how familiar this topic feels to you right now. So you can click on participants and then look on the right hand side, you should be able to see a yes and a no. So I would like to know first who here, or, or let me ask you as a yes or no, 
are you leading through change right now? Click the yes if you are leading through change right now and click the no if you are not. So the answers are coming in and it looks like so far we have 40 yeses and five noes. I kind of suspected that might be the case, but right now this is the case study and what it looks like to lead through change. I wanted to also know what, what emotions do you associate with change? So in the chat box, please just write one emotion word of what you think of when you think of change. And I'll give everyone just a second or two to do that. You can click on at the bottom, you should be able to click on chat and then make sure it says it's to everyone. So I see innovation, yep, so change can be good. Anxiety, yep, exciting, discomfort, disruption, flexibility, roller coaster ride, adaptability, deep breath, exhaustion, healthy, opportunity, positive, uncertainty, unsettling, dynamic, inspiration. Yes, these are all great words, and I think that's what this will really touch on today, both the opportunity and the challenge of leading through change. So the way that today will work is we are going to do this in um, three parts. The first part is a panel with a Q&A that I'll be asking all of you to participate in by raising your hand and then waiting to be called on. There is one update to our panelists, which is unfortunately Jim was not able to join us today. He got called into a last minute meeting. So this is, you know, an experiential opportunity for us to lead through change too. But he has said that he would like to do a special program with all of you at another date. So you will get the opportunity to speak with him just at a later date. Then after the panel, we'll take a quick break. And then we'll come back together and you'll actually get the chance to practice through a simulation exercise that we'll talk about a lot more at the second part. And then the third part is an optional lunch. Totally up to you, but if you'd like to stick around and get to know each other better, no agenda, just bring your lunch and hang out with us for a little bit longer. And then just a quick note, we are recording just part one. So we're recording just the panel. So that's it for me. I want to introduce our, um, or wonderful partners at Suffolk and then hand it over to Sonia. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Mallory Sullivan, who is the Managing Director at the National Center for Public Performance. Mallory, can you give a wave? And she'll be sending you lots of goodies through the chat throughout the day. And then I'd also like to introduce Professor Sonia Elaine, who's a visiting instructor for the Institute for Public Service and hand it over to her for a quick welcome from Suffolk. And Sonia, you're on mute. Thank you, Allison, for um, this partnership. Um, first of all, let me say good morning, future leaders um, here in the city of Boston. It's, it's our pleasure to host you this morning at Suffolk University um, Institute for Public Service. We are, uh, historically, we are known for shaping and creating um, leaders here in the city and beyond. So um, I expect nothing but greatness from all of you once you, um, once you go through this, this experience here with the chamber. Um, we, um, we have many programs um, in the Institute of Public Service. Our, our degree program is a master's in public administration, which has a concentration in state and local government, healthcare, nonprofit management, and performance measurement. Um, and we, I, I heard from our graduate of our admissions, who would also like to um, offer you a, a reduction in application if you're interested. So they'll waive the, they'll waive the application fee of um, $50. And um, I will share with, with Allison information for all of you if you're um, interested. We have many information sessions that we'll have, even though they're, they, they may all be a, a, of a virtual nature, but we will still active and want to make sure that anyone who's interested in attending Suffolk University has the opportunity to speak to faculty and to our alumni. So with that, um, I wish you a great day and I'll, I'll be back with you later on in the program. But thank you, Allison. Thank you. So now I'm really excited to introduce to you the moderator of today's panel and she'll introduce the rest of the panelists. We're really lucky to be joined by an amazing panel that represents leaders of all different industries and sectors. And Sue O'Connell will be our moderator today. She self-describes as a practical progressive, which I loved, Sue. I loved that part of your bio. And is a political commentator at NACN. In addition, she's a co-publisher of Bay Windows, New England's largest newspaper serving the LGBT community. She also publishes the Boston Weekly publication, The South End News, and co-owns the Edge Media Network, a network of LGBT news web portals. Busy. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Sue. 
Hi, Allison. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to the Chamber and Suffolk for putting this on. This is uh, so exciting because uh, change management obviously is a crucial skill for all leaders at all times. And obviously, uh, this couldn't be a more fortunate and unfortunate time to have a panel for leading through change. And COVID, uh, clearly a masterclass in responding to change. And this panel is going to focus on how to adapt and lead through the unexpected change like the one we're experiencing now and how to proactively steward change. Uh, I'm Irish and we have an Irish saying that goes, don't worry, nothing will be okay. So uh, being proactive when it comes to change is an important thing. We're lucky to be joined today by three incredible panelists. They represent a broad array of industries and sectors. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the panel, ask a few questions, and then I'm gonna turn it over to you to ask your questions. You could just raise your hand and Allison will call on you. Remember to unmute yourself before you ask the question. And I am thrilled to introduce our panelists. So let's get, keep, it, keep it brief so we can dive right in. Uh, John Barrows, he's the Chief of Economic Development for the City of Boston, a position he's held since 2014. He brings a passion for a sustainable community development and economic inclusion and equity. And prior to this appointment, John served 13 years as Executive Director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Welcome, John. Malia Lazu is the regional president of Berkshire Bank, where she has focused on diversity and community-related community initiatives. Malia has 20 years of community organizing experience. She served as a senior advisor for actor and philanthropist Harry Belafonte and founded the Social Impact Firm Urban Labs. And Rick Musial is the vice president of external relations for the New England Aquarium, where he has played an instrumental role in the aquarium's increased focus on climate resiliency. And prior to that, Rick served as vice president at Citizens Bank as the chief of staff uh, and the chief of staff uh, at the, to the Massachusetts Senate president. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. I'm gonna jump right in with our first question. Um, and I, I wanna to talk to you about uh, responding to unexpected change. Um, clearly none of us, and uh, have experienced anything like to the magnitude that we're experiencing now. But it's not the um, only example. Can you walk through uh, a high level summary of a time when you and your organization or community responded to unexpected change and the steps that you took? I, I want to start with uh, you, Malia. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone. It's great to um to see everyone and thank you for joining us i hope as allison said everyone is safe and hunkered down um it's wonderful to get into a group i think um sue when you ask what is the first thing that you do it's actually for me whatever change that might be whether that might be a budget change or um you know a leadership change the first thing you want to do is actually circle the wagons i believe that you put people first um, and in times of change people have anxiety naturally they have uncertainty <clears throat> and especially in a time like covid um folks may also be dealing with a lot of stuff at home and so the first thing that you want to do is make sure that people are okay and you want to check in with people i think the second thing is you want to see what of the what of the change can you control and what can't you control um, and the things you can't control, you mitigate for. Um, you know, the things you can control, you plan out. Um, the last thing I will say is that in a time of change, communication is key. Um, fluidity. You know, you really want to be more of a palm tree. Um, I'm from Hawaii, so <laughs> all these things in terms of palm trees. but. You know, you want to be more of a palm tree and, and be able to move and you want to help your team do that because you never know when things are changing, who's going to come up with that idea or that innovation. And so that open communication helps people co-create together. And I think that also helps people feel more confident um, in, in moving forward and, and solving the problem. Great. Thank you. Rick, you know, the New England Aquarium has been... Uh, purposefully looking at change in terms of climate change and the climate crisis and every single decision that the New England Aquarium has made, I think, at least for the past decade or so, has been um, based on expecting change 
How are you all reacting to this change? Yeah, and so let me um, first say thanks for, for having me and it's great to see all of you um, uh, and great to be with all of you and, and share some thoughts. You know, for us, this is a difficult period. You know, we have come into our own in terms of being a leading organization on the climate change front and no greater, better place to do it than on the, the edge of Boston's Harbor. Um, but, you know, we've been closed for the past 46 days and we are counting. Um, and a bulk of our revenue, like every other aquarium across the United States, gets the, the um, majority of our proceeds from visitors coming to learn about the animals that we have. We care for about 20,000 animals in two different uh, locations in two different cities here in Massachusetts. Um, and so we've had to figure out how to prioritize what our needs are to weather this storm. And so for us, say, on the external relations front, we've pivoted um, our conservation advocacy agenda towards federal financial relief for zoos, museums, and aquariums across the United States. And um, we've long thought that we were going to have an advocacy center on our .org, and, uh, and that's kind of always been a dream of mine in the short period of time I've been there. Um, but working with other aquariums, we were able to put something up and have folks be able to chime in with their member of Congress to help us advocate um, for that federal financial relief that we're so desperately needing these days. And, uh, you know, adversity breeds opportunity. We stood it up uh, on last Monday and by Thursday night, we had about 2,500 people who had already written their member of Congress saying, hey, yes, we agree that these type of conservation minded organizations need uh, help as well. Um, so, you know, kind of taking off our lens on the typical conservation agenda that we put forward on climate change and uh, marine mammal protection to saying, okay, in order for us to get back on track and do this, we do need um, government relief and being able to pivot that way, being nimble and flexible and agile um, so that we could, so that we could do that. John, one of uh, a clear challenge being uh, in uh, local government leadership is that every day there's some sort of emergency that you have to deal with. There's also, you have to plan ahead for what, what you wanna do in the future is, uh, from next month to the, the next century sometimes. Um, what, what has the city done and how have you been involved in finding the priorities that you need to focus on during the COVID crisis? Good morning, Sue. Thanks for the question. I really appreciate your leadership uh, moving this panel. I just wanted to say thank you first to our panelists, Rick, Malia, good to see you guys, and, and to Suffolk and the Chamber for uh, putting this together. Thanks, uh, Professor Sonia, for your leadership and partnership. And then to the, uh, to the members of this esteemed group of, uh, of great leaders in Boston doing great work. Thanks for the work that you guys do and just looking at the names and organizations. It's a pretty impressive uh, collection. Uh, Alyssa, thanks for, uh, for setting us up well in the beginning there. Uh, Sue, to your question, the, um, I have never seen the mayor be sharper or more decisive. Um, every morning we start our day with a conversation on how many lives we've lost, how many people have been infected, how many beds we have and the resources we have in the city to manage this crisis. Um, it's, we, we brought on a consulting firm and they've done a great job of making sure that whatever data we need is in front of us so that we can lead with clarity. And so uh, this uh, city government before uh, the crisis would be shaped by the political winds or the louder voice or what was happening in context. The context here is really clear and um, you know, it's not just something that is shared within local government, but the people, the folks in Boston are all clear that we're trying to save lives. And so the responsiveness, the, um, we tried to raise $10 million to try to help people make sure that they had food and shelter. We've now raised about $30 million. We have asked businesses to uh, make sure that they're not laying off and uh, firing employees and make sure that they're laying them off to make sure they can collect un un unemployment. And business owners are calling in droves asking, how do we do that? What's the difference? How do I make sure I can save my employee and make sure they can collect unemployment? I mean, the kind of drive that we have as a collective in, in, in this city right now uh, under this crisis um, is clear. The objections, of, uh, objections are clear. 
and it feels like we're being super effective. Do you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, John. Uh, Emily, I want to do a follow up and, and um, ask a question sort of when we get through the other side of this, we still will have crisis, still be crises that come up. And they can be as simple as, a, as, and I don't mean simple to diminish it, but as a snowstorm. You know, I'm old enough to remember when we had our April Fool's snowstorm, you know, some 20 years ago. I worked at the Boston Phoenix and they uh, asked us all to walk into work. Uh, in the storm, even though we weren't publishing that day and we had nothing to do and the production guy went around and drove and brought people in for no reason, right? Because you had to go to work. That was the mentality that, you know, the generation I came up in is you had to be at work at any cost. Um, and now here we are uh, some 20 years later and we are at work, many of us, if we're, we're privileged and lucky enough, but we're working in a different way and the employers are, are adapting to that. So I wanna ask what you see happening when it comes to how employers will uh, change the way they expect employees to work. And if you think the focus moving forward from businesses will be less on productivity and more on how you support your employees to produce. Absolutely, Sue. You know, before COVID, we as a bank, um, so Berkshire Bank has about 1,500 employees from Vermont to Philly. Um, and so in many ways, um, you know, we're, we're very different workforces. Um, and we obviously have a retail component. <clears throat> um, and I'll get to that in a second and how we're sort of rethinking our retail workforce. Um, but pre-COVID, we had already been looking at a work from home policy. Um, and really seeing it as a way to move into the future. Um, obviously, there's cost efficiencies there, um, but really there's lifestyle expectations um, that can reinforce a, a work from home, um, a work from home scenario. And so we had already been setting employees up to be able to work from home. Um, being a bank security um, is something that's very important. So you just can't like open your laptop and start doing work for the bank. Um, you have to be on our servers and all these other terms that I just nod when our um, CTO talks about. But, um, and so we were already on that path. And when COVID hit, um, we decided to lean into it. So we have um, about, um, we have, oh, I don't wanna say 100%, um, but everyone but three people um, that can work from home are right now. And it was a huge undertaking. Um, our CTO for you know, the first 10 days of the shutdown um, probably did not sleep and, um, and it was hard. But um, what we're finding now is our role to your point about productivity is how do we support our employees in living full lives while not while maybe the sanctuary of a home um, is being diluted a little bit, you know, so we're really working on how do we, you know, we're doing a step challenge right now um, with our employees. Um, we have several like fo photo contests, um, you know, but we also have launched a health and wellness program. Um, so I think when it comes to being productive at home, the thing that employees really need to, or employers really need to take into account is that how do I support my employee in turning it off? Um, and that will help them be more productive. Now on the retail side, um, you know, I, I know that many banks are already looking towards digital. FinTech is sort of pushing us to do that. Um, and I think banks will have less, branches will have less people in them and it'll be about protecting the, those people in, in the long term and short term. Thank you. Uh, Rick, you, you're, you're in a particular category that has unique challenges. Um, I, I think it's, it's safe to say with, with all of the museums, um, you know, the, the, even though the revenue isn't coming in, money still needs to be spent on things, whether it's an art museum, keeping the security, keeping the temperature correct, um, taking care of all of the pieces of uh, art and valuable items. In your case, actual living beings, living beings are there. 
uh, that need to be fed and cared for and all of the work that goes on to just uh, keeping them safe and, and happy. And I'm wondering what, what is the, the, the emergency st strategy that you're looking at at the New England Aquarium um, that you may have had in place already in case of a, 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 a what now might have been considered a slight emergency, like a flood, uh, which ha I know you've, you've worked to, to make sure the aquarium is less, is more flood proof than before. But what, what steps are you taking to both protect the beings that you're in charge of, the building you're in charge of, and finding a business model moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think about how difficult this is in this environment, but, you know, we're, the need to think about revenue diversification is now more paramount, paramount than ever and yet more challenging than ever. Um, so we've always thought that we've got to bring that 80% number down. And again, like I said, we're not any different than any other um, aquarium across the United States. We're all in this predicament. And in fact, cultural institutions by and large are, are all in the same boat, so to speak. Uh, so that's you know, certainly paramount. And as we think about how we re-envision Central Wharf, which is our home here in Boston, um, for the next 50 years, we just we celebrated our 50th birthday this year. Um, you know, how do we think about diversifying the revenue streams that we can um, tap to support the work that we do, both on the visitor experience side and on the education side, as well as the science research uh, side of what we do? I mean, we've got, as I mentioned, we've got um, two homes to our animals. We've got a facility on Central Wharf in Boston. We've got our animal care hospital in Quincy. Um, we have two office properties um, adjacent to the aquarium. We've got the Simons Theater. Um, uh, you know, we have the home to our Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, where all of our scientists and researchers um, work out of. So I think for us, what's most paramount, and again, even more daunting in, in light of this pandemic is how do we diversify the revenue streams that we tap to support the work that we do so that we can be uh, as insulated as possible? And granted, we're never gonna be completely insulated from certainly um, challenges like today, but we've always thought about that. And I think as we look forward, and some of you have heard our vision for Central Wharf as the blue way, the extension of the success that the city and, and the state has had on, on the Greenway, how do we connect the Greenway to the harbor and make sure that the harbor is a place for all to feel like they belong? And, um, so that's something that I think is top of mind as we do that. We've got 20,000 animals between um, our two buildings and uh, you know, things, uh, John and, and the team have been great about this. You know, we're a water dependent business. We pull water in from the harbor, we treat it, we warm it, we cool it, depending on what exhibit it's going into. And then it goes into the exhibit and we pull it out of the exhibit and we, warm it or we cool it and we treat it and we send it back out into the harbor cleaner than it came. And so, um, you know, those are things that people forget. And we're a 50 year old building. So doing that is not as efficient as you would typically like. But um, I think for us looking forward, it's, it's trying to figure out how we find the revenue streams to support the work that we're doing. Thanks, Rick. Uh, John, I want to ask you about um, your work across multiple sectors. You know, this program is all about being socially responsible and civically engaged in our approach to leadership. Um, you know, you're the chief of economic development for the city of Boston. And how would you like to see uh, folks and leaders in different sectors and industries get out of these towers and these silos that we're all in and maybe take a more horizontal approach to working together to solve problems and achieve goals? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a fabulous question. Um, I recognize that right now there were more people connecting um, than they have even when we didn't have physical distancing, at least in my, in my, in my world, Sue, um, there are unlikely partners talk, talking about what we need to do together to make sure that um, Boston can get to the other side of this pandemic uh, whole. Um, there are clear vulnerables to different segments of our society. Uh, clear disparities on who is being impacted on this health uh, pandemic. Uh, we've got segmentations uh, by age. Uh, clearly, our older population is getting hit hard. We've got segmentation by race, by income. Um, and so people are coming together. Unlikely partners are coming together. If, if the people of Boston are going to get out of their silos and get out of their towers, as you say, and 
kind of get together and try to have a, 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 an impactful set of relationships, this is the time to do it. Uh, this is the time to reach across your organization and learn more about what, or, or what other organizations are doing. It's the time to try to figure out how you connect through Zoom and other platforms with colleagues and just have simple conversations about what's on their minds, what, what matters right now. People are sharper than ever in terms of the things that they need to do to move their missions forward, to move the things that they care about forward. And so I would say seize the moment. Uh, for everybody on this call, uh, this is, it's not the time to uh, socially isolate. It's time to physically isolate. It's a time to connect and connect to your networks and connect to people and just have conversations because together with those conversations and those relationships, we're gonna be able to solve a lot more. Thank you, John. Um, Malia, I wanna ask you, this is one of these moments where uh, we hope we've been training for it for our entire careers, right? Where uh, many of us have been advocating for a long time that we have to have people at the table. We have to have representation. We have to have diversity of, uh, of all sorts, right? From all sorts of, of communities, all sorts of economic status. And now here we are with this crisis where we are concerned that some members of our communities and some communities either aren't being spoken to, aren't getting the information, aren't uh, at the table when it comes to making plans to reduce harm. And I'm wondering what your experience has been uh, in the workplace and in your career in making sure that people see the value of, of what diversity really means. It's not just, you know, what color you are or what, how much money you make or where you lived or what your political point of view, but what the importance of bringing all those threads into uh, planning, especially when it comes to planning for change and reacting to uh, crisis change. Um, thank you, Sue. You know, being, um, I'm a proud community organizer. Um, and um, I'm just going to give quick side dap to John real quick um, as, um, as someone who um, also really knows the importance of, um, you know, I think what community organizers do is that they understand that a group of people coming together with like minds and a shared goal can accomplish that. And it might not look the way you think it's going to look, <laughs> right? It might not um, come with all of the bells and whistles. Um, it might not come with, um, you know, a, a Time Magazine article, but you can actually protect and build your community. Um, and so, you know, going from working for someone like Harry Belafonte, um, who lives that in, in so many ways, um, to being a banker um, at you know, one of the biggest crises that I have seen um, in, in, my, um, in my time. Um, the first couple of days, to be quite honest, were very emotional and, and very hard for me because I felt very helpless. Um, in times of change, the last place you wanna be is in an institution. And that may sound counterintuitive, but institutions, um, institutions are maintainers of tradition and so things like innovation fluidity you know i think it's why we're seeing um cities and governors right um responding to what they need to respond to um versus you know larger uh, um larger institutions than that but um to be at a bank felt like i wasn't going to actually be able to lead through change i was going to be able to like help a few folks get money, um, but I wasn't actually going to be able to reinforce the need for what King called a beloved community. And I think, Sue, that, that, that's what you're talking about, right, of, of all of us, you know? Um, and I thought a lot about King's three evils um, of poverty, racism, and war. And I was like, they're all just kind of coming in right now, and, and um, so how do we lead? So, um, I, I say all that to say that I was able to find my place as an organizer um, at this moment um, to not only help people, but to also deconstruct power in, in banking. So what I, the things that I'm putting forward in PPP or in um, COVID relief are things we're going to be able to do 
after COVID, right? I'm, I'm building, to Rick's point, I'm building new products that are going to respond so that we can actually bank everyone with dignity. Um, and that really helped me be able to center that nuance and that importance of the beloved community in the work. Because um, I think for me, as an organizer, I know that it's us. It's this group right here, right? It's a group of people that lead through change, not policies, not procedures, not tradition, but what we decide as a people is acceptable or not acceptable. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's been a really interesting ride, um, but I think what I've been able to do inside the bank is have folks see that we can center um, authentic diversity and, and, you know, and compassion for, for people. Um, and that means that we have to take on non-customers for PPP. Um, right. And, you know, those conversations felt really good to have um, at this moment and made me feel like I was doing more than helping a bank do good. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Malia. Um, my mom used to always say that uh, if you walked into a room and you were the only one of your kind, however you defined it, you had a moral obligation to stay in that room and, you know, do the work. So uh, I think it's- Yes, a, it's, Sue's yeah. mom. Yeah. Sue's mom is just killing us. <laughs> All right, so I want to ask, go to a rapid fire area right now and ask you, each of you a, just one question for the, a quick answer before we open it up for folks to answer. And Rick, I'm gonna start with you. So heads up, here it comes, you ready? Um, we've been discussing how we respond to change uh, and how you know, we should steward positive change. Can you give one tip to our future leaders on how to proactively lead the change they want to see in their teams organizations, industries, or communities? Oh, there's a list. There's a list. Yeah. There's a list. That's why it's rapid uh, fire. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'll say this. Don't punt. Don't punt. Don't be afraid. Don't punt. Think big. Be bold. Uh, you know, think about opportunities. You know, it's hard because I think to some degree, you know, you think, okay, adversity and opportunity feels to be somewhat, um, not sensitive, but I think, you know, we envision ourselves coming out of this and we've had some really tough times, but I, you know, I think we will come out of this, this challenge uh, and this time a stronger organization. Think big, don't be afraid, don't punt, don't lose an opportunity. John, what do you think? What's your one tip? Be clear about your values and your organization's values um, and make sure that that's where you're leading from. Great, Malia? Remember, you will get through it. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's very simple and right on point. I just want to share also uh, over at NBC 10 Boston and NECN where I work, we had just moved in February finally into a $125 million building uh, that's the size of three football fields that houses Telemundo, New England, NECN, NBC 10 Boston, and NBC Boston Sports. And we have three to 500 employees that were all for the first time under the same roof uh, when COVID hit. And uh, we at uh, the station were able to uh, pivot into almost, almost our entire staff working from home, directing shows from home, writing and producing from home, I'm broadcasting from home, uh, and I would underscore what everybody just said, that um, in times of crisis, all those things are important. But also, um, think about how you can do it, uh, not necessarily uh, what the problems are that are going to keep you from doing it, whatever the it is. So, Allison, I'm going to kick it over to you now so you can uh, ask our participants if they'd like to join in and ask our wonderful panel some of their own questions. Thank you, Sue, and thank you so much for all these panelists. I learned so much, and it really touched on a lot of themes that will come up throughout the rest of this program on authentic leadership, diversity and inclusion, civic engagement. So thank you so much for helping us to think about how to both think long-term and also pivot quickly in the face of change. So we do have a couple of questions. So Alexa, you are up first. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you, Allison. Um, Sue, so, so I attended the, um, the virtual convening session on return to work last week, and um, 
the leader from Weber Shandwick described communications as a currency of change and how the current PR focus is on persuasion versus promotion and crisis is a time when company reputation may be redefined. So my question is, how would you effectively communicate change as a leader of a team, organization, or region? And how would you think about the extent that you would want to editorialize? Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question. Thanks for asking. I actually have a lot of sympathy right now for public relations people because, um, you know, I, I don't know if, if you know what kind of pitches we get on a regular basis. Uh, everything from, hey, have you considered your sneakers lately? And, how, you know, and now we have to think, we care about your feet, right? Like every every company is caring about me and how I'm doing right now, more so than usually my family does. So it's it's an interesting time to be in public relations. In the news business, it's it's been a, a challenge for us, I think, and I speak generally uh, in the mainstream and reliable news business, where we don't want to give information out unless we have verified it and we think that it's true and we're giving the right information. And at the same time, we have to understand that if we're not delivering messages to our viewers they're not going to that they want to hear or are interested in they're not going to watch right so as much as i would like to be spending all of our time talking about the uh, things that i think are important to our communities i also know that we have to talk about things that may not be that important to our communities but are important to some people if that makes any sense to you and i think that the the most important thing that companies can do right now uh, is um, we, we have a sort of internal joke now that if we get uh, one more commercial that says something like in these times of crisis or in this time of uncertainty, you know, how do, how do you try and sell something when nobody is buying anything and we all are, are very rightly so focused on our survival and on the survival of our, our democracy and our country, but at the same time companies um, need to, to communicate their values, I think. And I don't think it's, it's um, inappropriate to be funny about it. You know, I, I think some levity, if you're uh, um, uh, wanting to, to pitch a product, especially some of the restaurants that are, are looking for takeout. I saw, I forget which one it was, but a fast food restaurant that was pitching how you miss their food, like you miss your family, but you also miss their burritos, right? Um, so I think that there's a, there's a balance that can be had. Um, but again, to what the panelists have all made very clear, if you're not a very good and moral company to begin with, you're not going to be able to pitch it right now that you are. Sure. So uh, when you're building your companies and you're working on the messaging, um, if you put your customers first and you put your employees first and, um, you know, do, do moral business, uh, I think that when crisis happens, you'll be in a good position to make the right decisions. Great. Um, we'll go over to Michaela next. And um, sorry, Alex, I should have said this to you too, but when you ask your question, can you please say your name and your company and then ask your question quickly. And when you're done asking your question, actually click raise hand again and it will lower your hand so I can keep track of who has and has not said their question. So turning things over to you, Michaela. Hi, thank you all for being here with us. Um, so I'm Michaela Scheinheit. I work in community engagement for Beat Envy. We're a children's cancer foundation. Um, and my question, I guess, is for any of the panelists. Um, but just right now, everyone seems to be reacting very differently to what's going on. Um, and I was just wondering how you're keeping your staff, your leadership, and stakeholders sort of on a similar or the same, ideally, plan of action. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say that uh, for us, it's been communication, communication, communication. So I start my day with an 8 a.m. with the mayor and the cabinet, um, and we go over data and what's going on and what, we're gonna, what we've done in the last 24 hours, what we're doing the next 24 hours. Uh, and then I've got a four o'clock with my department staff and it's a similar kind of thing. Here are our priorities. Here's, here's what we've, we're trying to do. Has it been done? What's been the obstacle? How do we make sure it gets done? And so it really is a, a, a high level of communication, um, really short term, right? We've got clear priorities. We, 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 we're clear on where we're trying to drive to and then communicating and making sure people get information on a daily basis has been really key. I'll, I'll jump in and add, you know, on that front, you know, when we talk about, you know, employee wellness, we talk about bringing your whole self to the workplace. And so whether your workplace is in an institution 
or if it's at your home, um, or you make your home look like your institution, <laughs> um, you know, it's checking in with your employees. Uh, you know, I, um, you know, my team's a little bit smaller than it was when I first started 10 months ago. And uh, one of my one-on-ones with one of my teammates this morning was just talking to her and seeing how she's doing. Um, and sharing, you know, for me uh, as a leader, being vulnerable to say, hey, you know what, last week I had a shitty week. Sorry, Allison. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was, it was pretty much of a, a downer and, and being able to say, Hey, you know, I'm going through these ebbs and flows just like you are. And it's okay. Um, cause we're going to lean in together and we're going to get through this together. Um, it's okay to laugh, to make jokes as Sue was alluding to, and, and kind of thinking of things that are silly and that add a little levity to the average day, which sometimes is a downer. We're kind of programmed by the hour or half hour. Um, to Zoom and, and all that. So um, remember, I think for me that, you know, I'm a person, my team are people that go through highs and lows, um, and they're a little bit more challenging and different and probably need a little bit more of you as a leader as a result. And I think that for me, it's just being there and saying, okay, hey, listen, we blew through our one-on-one -on -one today for a half hour, just talking. And that's okay. That's okay. You know, I, I would also add that, you know, his, history can be our, our teacher. Um, I, I was in the workplace during the emergence of uh, HIV and AIDS and saw how terribly and horribly uh, people were treated in the workplace. And we want to make sure that when we're in the workplace and maybe someone comes to work who was infected with COVID and had symptoms, but for whatever reasons, didn't think, well, maybe I'm infecting others because it was early or all the millions of reasons that people uh, don't change their behavior or don't recognize their behavior. You know, as leaders, we have to make sure that we are learning from prior lessons and prior mistakes, whether they're ours or histories, to make sure that we are making the workplace um, uh, fair and equitable and understanding that we are to, you know, to Rick's, we're all people, we're all human beings and that we need to be able to come together after this and be the team that we were or and a better team than we were but you know history has lots of terrible examples of ways that we have messed things up and it's a good place to go in crisis to see if we can learn lessons moving forward and i would just add a tactical thing um and i know that um carleen is a part of your crew and um she's one of our my bankers um and so um, you know, I say like she can tell you more, but one of the things that we did is um, I got everyone master class and I'm not doing a commercial for master class, but I enjoy it. Um, and all everyone on my team got a membership for the year. And so that not only gave us something to do, but also gave us something to talk about. Like, you know, like someone likes the cooking master classes, someone, you know, and, and so it, it sort of gave us a way to be connected and have water cooler moments um, without being together. I love that. We are unfortunately getting near the end of our time, which I hate. And so I'm going to ask the next three people to actually all just ask your questions in a row so that we can gather a couple more questions. And then we'll I'll ask the panelists to see if you can um, find like some common theme or just something to respond to within those three. And um, it's funny you mentioned Carlene because Carlene, you are up next and it will go in this order. It'll be Carlene, Alyssa, and then Krista. And I'll ask all three of you to just kind of go one after the other and ask your question. And I'll ask the panelists to kind of just answer like some common theme you heard from within them. So go ahead, Carlene. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carlene Porcena. As um, Malia said, I'm with Berkshire Bank as one of the my bankers. Um, my question is to tag on to the theme of collaboration and really how do you create the buy-in within your organizations, institutions, to really think about collaboration differently at this time. I think it's easy to say we wanna all work together, but when you're in a space of doing things in a traditional way, how do you get people to really get that concept and move on it? Thank you. Go ahead, Alyssa. Hi, everybody. Alyssa Dion Rodning. I'm with Marriott International, and I oversee, I'm a senior account executive with the international team. Um, my question, Malia, you were talking about being in the palm tree, and I guess I was wondering if you had any tips about how you help foster that environment for your team when they're feeling a little more rigid, um, especially with change being scary for some folks. So how do you really help them feel more um, mobile in the wind? 
Thank you. Go ahead, Krista. Thank you. Um, drawing on the, the reading, we, we saw that wicked problems are typically symptoms of and indicative of larger issues. Um, I also saw in, in the panel in the beginning um, that a lot of the a lot of us recognize challenges as opportunities. Um, so my question is, how can we use the response to the coronavirus as an opportunity to build a more inclusive economy for Boston? Thank you. Who would like to go first? I heard. Well, there was a directed question to you, Malia. So maybe you can go first while the other panels think about how they're going to respond to three questions at once. A challenge <laughs> I threw at you. <laughs> <laughs> great, great one. I think it does touch on the collaboration um, piece as well. Um, so I think the the first thing um, to being a palm tree or whatever is um, you know is being self reflective. And I can say like in our team. Um, you know, similar to what Rick was saying is, you know, we checked in with each other to see how each other are doing. And, you know, I've had moments where I, you know, we're, we're doing something differently and there was a little pushback. Um, and rather than, um, you know, rather than mowing through it, we, we talked about it. You know, I think um, being fluid means that you're, you're observant and that you have a, an open heart. Um, but it also leading means that you're clear about your leadership. Um, and I think, you know, it's the same thing in collaboration, like, um, you know, being able to have a high EQ, um, it will help you be, be a better palm tree. Um, but it, it will also help you build better collaborations. The, the last thing I will say is that for me, your team and people are the number one thing. It's above profits. It's above, it's above everything. Um, and, it's really, really important that you support your team so that they can bend and not break. And that's why we're doing some of the health and wellness and introducing meditation and, and things like that, because um, you know, we all need tools to do it. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to jump in? Well, uh, go ahead, Don. No, you go ahead. No, you go, go, go. You know, I'll go in kind of reverse order, I guess, COVID as, a, as an opportunity. I mean, you know, we see 1.4 million visitors every year. We're usually the number one or number two cultural destination in our region. And so, you know, our folks are starting to think about, you know, a slow opening and what does that look like and social physical distancing and things like that, but also being mindful of the need to generate revenue and, and to continue to educate people about the oceans, about climate change and things like that. And so, you know, I'm kind of beating the drum um, going, okay, this is going to be hard. We're a 50 year old building. How do we do this? But how do we do it? That's fun. That's educational. That provides us with opportunity. Um, so that, you know, if we're doing floor decals because you need to stay six feet apart, well, okay, what are the different things that we can teach people at every six, uh, every sixth foot? Um, about climate change, about the cleanliness of the harbor, about what um, you know we're doing on the federal advocacy front to protect um, the ocean and things like that. So I think there's ways to continue to do that. Um, and I think that's great. I mean, we were one of the first organizations to stand up, you know, kind of rapid online programming and you should all check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, so I think, you know, you could, you know, as Gloria Stefan said, turn the beat around and figure out, you know, ways that some of you don't even know who Gloria Stefan is. So that's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, how do you turn it around? And, and on the collaboration front, you know, my, my time at, at Citizens Bank, sorry for my friends at Berkshire, um, but we used to jokingly say that we were like the stop and think team, like stop and think for a second, who needs to be involved in the decision making process so that all views are represented and um, so that, you know, the collective organization can make um, a, a decision. Um, and, and just on the collaboration front, I'd say, you know, my time at the State House, you know, we were always looking to pull in diverse opinions so that we were putting forth something um, that was really, really well prepared and well thought out and really did reflect the diversity of views. I used to jokingly say to, to one of Sue's comments earlier that, you know, in my role as chief of staff to the Senate president, I used to be the um, volunteer to be the human punching bag because you always put yourself in the uh, opposing view, in the opposing 
um, uh, position so that you were really thinking through things more thoughtfully and more collaboratively. And, uh, you know, you, you get really uh, thick skin as a result. So I think, you know, as much as, as, and as difficult of a time this is, there are opportunities there for us to come out of this as a stronger um, community, as a stronger city. And I'm, I'm very hopeful of that. Yeah, and, and that's, I would also add that, you know, when you're a leader and you have a staff uh, and you've got a bunch of employees, you're always gonna have a category of people that I call uh, this place uh, people. And the this place people, uh, no matter where they work, they always have complaints about how we do things at this place, right? So, of course, that didn't happen because of this place. And um, you, you, you can't change those people, right? And they're usually great employees, and they do a good job, but there's a, there's a certain grumbling nature that they just have. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong. I mean, often, you know, in the news business, we always say just because someone comes running into the building screaming something and you think that they're off the off their rocker, it doesn't mean they're wrong. <laughs> they could be absolutely right. And the same is true with the this place people who are grumbling about this place. But at the same time, if you listen to them and also do a great job communicating to everybody, right? Because one of the best antidotes, I think, to almost every structural problem within organizations is communication. And when things fall apart at places or there's a mistake or people feel um, you know, like they're not connected, even though you're, the management thinks they're doing a good job connecting, it's usually because communication broke down. So to sort of underscore what I think every panelist has said today, if you're doing a great job communicating, you are melting the ice cube of problems that are gonna exist in every workplace and also diminishing the challenges that um, just some personalities bring to a workplace. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that they're, they're not valuable and their opinions aren't valuable, but you know, once we get back to God willing, a 2% or 3% unemployment rate, uh, we're gonna have a lot of folks working in the workplace and communication I think is just one of the, the best ways that you can go about to, to smooth things so that you can work on your mission. So I just want to uh, maybe address the last question. It's uh, I'm not shocked. It's coming from Krista, who's who's part of our economic development team at the city, and this is something we are we are just really struggling with. Um, we're seeing some real dire numbers in terms of the impact of the coronavirus on our economy, both in terms of who's being laid off, what businesses are closing, what businesses have not been successful in applying for. The PPP, or you know, Malia, Malia talked about the issues of some of the application process. That those are huge issues. Um, we we are trying to project what the new economy, folks, the new economy will look like post COVID. We are not going to be in the same place. Transactions will not look the same. Consumer uh, behavior will not be the same. You have to be a different a different business. Um, if you're not online, you're in trouble if uh, you don't have certain procedures in place and if you, can't, if you can't build consumer confidence or employer confidence in your business model, you are in trouble, right? And so I think in many ways, I am worried about the fact that there, is, there are huge disparities in the types of businesses that were even online before COVID. There are huge disparities of the types of, of, of businesses that were treating their employees well before COVID. Um, and so uh, many of the complaints we give to the city today are from employees who are working low wage jobs and their, uh, their employers are not uh, showing any care for their safety and, safety and health uh, at this moment. And that's gonna exacerbate as the, as the economy continues to put pressure on certain business types. Um, so for us at the city, we're continuing to think about how we balance economic value with health risk. And so our, re, our reopening model is in fact a matrix that puts a set, set of values on that. Within the economic values, there is, ec, there is equity and inclusion. Um, and so with 68% of our small businesses closed today, we know that the longer this goes, the, least, the, 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 the less the number of businesses will open their doors back up. And for all of those who care about our restaurants, for example, Projections are 25 to 50% of restaurants will not open their doors. 
the longer this goes on, the more that's true. When we phase the opening of the economy, we're going to have huge burdens on businesses, mask, um, gloves, protocols, cleanliness, etc. Well, guess who's going to have the hardest time prov providing those uh, supplies and creating the kinds of plans that we're going to need to allow a business to open up, right? So we've got huge questions on equity. Government's got to step in. We've got to supply some of the uh, uh, supplemental uh, resources and equipment that is needed. Um, but if we're not thinking about it, we're going to have exacerbated uh, 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 d disparities in ways we've never seen before in our economy. Thank you, John. Thank you for that. I'm sorry to say that we've run out of time, but it's been uh, incredibly insightful learning from each of you. Uh, and clearly, this, these skills that we are uh, learning and living right now will uh, serve us well into the future. Uh, thank you so much to uh, John and Malia and Rick for joining us and to our participants. Uh, it's been great. I'm going to throw things back to Allison, who will uh, continue to give you instructions on how you can continue on connecting. And uh, I thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It's been great to connect with each of you uh, virtually, and I hope to see you all in, in person uh, soon. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for participating. Thank you so much to Sue and to our panel. If you all would like to join me in thanking them, there's actually a fun thing you can do. You can click on the reaction button and click the clap emoji and it'll pop up on your screen. So please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to our amazing panel.